Hello and welcome to the Nesson Soccer Podcast. I am Mark with Marcus in the Nesson Studios and some kind of breaking news here, throwing our podcast rundown in for a little bit of a loop. La Liga announced today, it is Thursday at the time of recording, that they will play at least one competitive match of the La Liga season in the United States every year for, I guess, 15 years? Is that right? <laughs> yeah, that's what that's it looks like. a pretty long commitment. And the, the biggest thing that comes to mind, well, a few things come to mind for me. One, I think it's not totally surprising that this would happen with a European league. They have played relatively meaningful competitions in the United States, like beyond just the International Champions Cup. But I think it's kind of surprising that it's, or not surprising, but why do you think La Liga is the league that ended up being the ones to put a game in the United States and as opposed to maybe the Premier League or any of the other European major European leagues? Probably because they are most, I think they have the biggest following of the European leagues in the United States, uh, or the potential for the biggest following mm -hmm. with the uh, Latino audience and a common language, and it's sort of part of the, the culture is to sort of follow Barcelona and Real Madrid. I mean, every time Barcelona and Real Madrid play anywhere on earth, their games are trending in the United States on Google with fans looking to watch them. How do you watch them? Where can you watch them? Right. So there is, uh, there's this interest that we know about. Now, what's really going to be interesting is what teams do they send over? Because uh -huh. if it's Sevilla and Valencia, two teams that are good teams that La Liga fans know and you know they have good players, sometimes they're in the champion. Usually one or both those teams are in the Champions League, but uh, who's going to come out and pay two, three, four figures to watch teams that aren't Barcelona and Real Madrid. Uh -huh. But the thinking is, is that being able to market a competitive game, marketing a competitive game will be easier to do and more successful than friendlies, which, uh, which we've right. seen all summer, every summer for the last decade or so. This is very interesting timing as well, because I, at least when I was looking at our rundown, I was, a big thing was going to be Ronaldo's effect on Serie A and then Ronaldo's effect on La Liga, both leaving and going from. Right. And it sort of like kind of falls in together that maybe the biggest target audience is within like the United States and trying to capture that potentially large amount of money. And instead of just bringing in one player to feature on one team, you're going to bring your league to the country. Yeah. It's like a big power move. And if it's successful, then it means that La Liga, as you just said, is the most popular European league within the United States, relatively. I don't even know if La Liga is. Well, you know, like, we, but we it's talk close. about we talk well, about like we talk about leagues, and this league is bigger than that league. This league is more powerful than that league. It really boils down to the clubs. Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody's going to turn in to tune in to see Ibar play Rayo Vallecano just in the same way. Watford versus Fulham, no offense to either of those clubs, right. isn't going to generate, it's not going to get American fans out of bed at 7 in the morning or 4 in the morning on the West Coast. So oh, the devil will be in the details is who is showing up. You can't just say, hey, it's a Spanish soccer league game and fans will flock to see it because if it ain't Barcelona, Real Madrid, Atletico Madrid, Sevilla or Valencia, or maybe Villarreal, or maybe a team that has a big Mexican player. I, I, I just see it as a hard sell. And I think Relevant Sports knows that as well. Right. It's just cool that there's going to be a large competitive match. And I think it's going to be a little bit of both. Like, Is it, though? Well, it, it will be. But it's, it's competitive. It's a, it's a league match. Will you watch it? What else do you want? But Okay. Will you watch it? I won't specifically be watching that La Liga match simply because it's in the United States on TV. But if I have the means and I'm in the area and I am, am able to go, I'm much more likely to attend that La Liga match than any MLS match or International Champions Cup match that could ever take place. You have roots in Florida. 
let's say hypothetically the game is in Miami uh -huh. and it's uh, let me see who's in La Liga this year a Celta Vigo against Alavis no. <laughs> no it's competitive it is competitive it's La Liga I do think there will probably be an effort it's to... Atletico Madrid against Espanol so, but I don't live in Florida now. If I did, then let's say you happen to there's be plenty in of people. Florida. Maybe I would. All right. I mean, it's the. I'm. You know, it's hard to say exactly. You just propose one game. I think a lot of things have to align for me to attend any sporting let's event. Let's say it's in New York. You're in the area. Yeah. Real Sociedad against Sevilla. Mm, maybe not. Why not? It's competitive. It is competitive, but it doesn't it doesn't have the star power, which I guess is what you say going back to the clubs. But I was going to say that I think there will be an effort to have Barcelona or Real Madrid in yes. these games at least every other year. And the, those two clubs might not like it very much, but I, it might be what happens. Yeah, but it won't be a home game that, you know, Barcelona and Real Madrid sell 85,000 plus tickets for every game. So, right. Yeah, it'll be uh, interesting to see what happens. I'm not ready to call it a gimmick, but I'm not ready to say it's not a gimmick. Uh, it's all aimed at growing yeah. La Liga's popularity in the United States. And, and I, I guess, you know, it's just one of many things that will take place in that, uh, in that effort over the next 15 years. I think it's also as genuine of an effort to you know, you can send your squad over for International Champions Cup matches in these American tours that the players don't like, the coaches don't like, the maybe any real top of the line players just aren't involved in the squad at all during that trip. During the summer. During the summer. But it, with this, it's a real genuine effort and I think just something that a genuine soccer fan in the United States would at least appreciate that they can attend this match. Uh, if they if they choose, I guess. <laughs> yeah. See, when we don't talk about things beforehand, then I think we get our most genuine disagreements on things because we hardly even discussed this topic before we started because just sort of just happened. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> moving on to more La Liga action. <laughs> Two La Liga teams, Atletico Madrid and Real Madrid, participated in the UEFA Super Cup on Wednesday. Atletico Madrid won 4-2 in extra time. Diego Costa had two goals. If you read headlines, it's, you know, this was a statement game for Atletico Madrid. To, no, we're, we're contending. And it's Real Madrid's first competitive match without Ronaldo. What were you most looking at in this match? Was it even the match itself? No, it's if I could see it on uh, Bleacher Report or Turner Sports. Yeah. And eventually I was able to. Um, Figure it out. Yeah, yeah, it was something new. But what was your question? Well, I guess you, you're getting there. Is What did you think of the Turner broadcast, I think, was uh, what we were going for? It was okay. Yeah. It was, there was nothing, nothing really uh, stood out. I think they had Tim Howard and Stu Holden on with Kate Abdo. They had an announcer. I mean, it didn't seem like it was. The in-game broadcast didn't, was, wasn't much different than anything you would see on any other network. Right. Pre-game, post-game, halftime, I tend to look away or not pay too much attention to it. I thought the studio looked a little Spartan, but you know, okay. they have, okay. I guess the last game I watched, or you know, the last uh, real broadcast I watched was the World, the World Cup Finals. Yeah, so that's so, a little different. Yeah, <laughs> compared to Red Square. Um, yeah, no, I thought it was okay. Steve Nash was on it. Can't recall him saying anything at all. Steve Nash. Yeah, Steve Nash is one of uh, Turner's soccer experts. That's awesome. Yeah, well, Steve Nash loves the game. Yeah. Thought it was good. So let me ask you, did you miss anything about the no. Fox Sports broadcast? You didn't miss Rob Stone? No, <laughs> I didn't see enough of Rob Stone <laughs> he's, uh, he's over the summer. A lot of him. Well, yeah, I think it, I, I kind of agree that all these uh, networks pretty much do more or less a similar job. Yeah. And uh, nobody's I, reinventing the wheel. I thought and it Turner, doesn't need to be I was kind of hoping Turner might do something a little bit different. But, you know, we'll see how it, open, how, how it unfolds. It's their first, it was their first game. But mm -hmm. so it wasn't blown away by it, wasn't horrified by it. So. so Real Madrid begins life without Ronaldo and sort of the new look, new identity 
Real Madrid. Did, what did you take away from that? I mean, Zinedine Zidane is gone as well. I guess the biggest names are Gareth Bale and Karim Benzema and Luka Modric, Marco Asensio. <laughs> Tony Kroos. Tony Kroos. Sergio Ramos. I guess they're still stacked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they should be just fine. Except they lost. They lost. But is it a sign of anything to come in La Liga in the season? Or is it just the first match of a long, you know, nine-month season with many different matches and many different competitions and different forms and not a real indication of what we're going to see? Um... No, I saw Real Madrid conceded four goals, which is something they didn't do once uh, in three, two and a half seasons under Zidane. They didn't concede four. Really? Yeah. It's a long time. So it looks like they, you know, having a little bit of trouble at the back. Uh, I didn't watch the game so closely to, you know, I couldn't really pick up what they were doing tactically. But, you know, I know they were going for it and they conceded after a minute I mean it didn't really look like Real Madrid they weren't in full control and Atletico Madrid kudos they I think that's their seventh trophy under uh, Diego Simeone so they look like they're for real so we mentioned the four goals and we've talked about Kaylor Navas versus Courtois do you think that with this and now maybe if Navas continues to start early in the season does he have a super short leash I think at the first to turn on him will be sort of media calling for Courtois to be put in net and be the ultimate starter, and then maybe like fans will start to call for it. But how long of a leash do you think he has if they're losing games and surrendering three goals at a time? And Will he get a fair shake that, oh, the defense isn't doing their job, or will it all ultimately fall on the goalkeeper? Uh, the leash will be shorter than he deserves. Yeah. I don't know how long. They'll stick with him, but another tough outing like this between now and I don't know when the first international break is, probably in a couple weeks. That could, not Navas could be, I don't think they'll sell him before the uh, end of the transfer window, but I don't see Navas in there for the long term. If he's still starting by the winter break, I'll be shocked. Well, with how much they paid for Courtois, you got to imagine you know, they, he's going to get an opportunity at some point. Yeah, Even if Navas is playing pretty well, he'll get an opportunity. $35 million for Real Madrid, it's not too much. <laughs> okay, so Atletico Madrid, obviously a, a good showing, winning 4-2 in the Super Cup. But where do they stand in La Liga? Barcelona ran away with the league last year, but Atletico has kind of been right there and then not right there. Slightly off the pace, but then right there again with Real Madrid and Barcelona. And then even kind of creeping into, at times, very specific times, one of the top teams, one of the top clubs in the world. And are, are we in another season where Atletico is going to be at their max top tier performance? Or was this kind of a flash in the pan and it's just, they're not going to be able to keep up with it throughout that the whole season? Atletico might be the best team in Spain. Ah. Um, I mean, that's what they're going for. Atletico's been an excellent, they've been an excellent team since about 2012. Uh, Champions League finals 2014, 2016, semifinalists. Uh, they won the Europa League last year, uh, semifinalists in 2017, uh, Champions League. So, I mean, they've been an elite team for several years now but what's interesting this year is that they like Barcelona and Real Madrid now are kind of developing into something that they might not have been three years ago um, this is a season where Diego Simeone talked about young players wanting to come to Atletico Madrid now this is their second season in their new stadium and they signed Thomas Lamar and uh, Gelson Martins two of the top wingers in Europe, uh, or top young wingers. Defensive midfielder Rodri uh, Rodrigo Hernandez got him from Villarreal. So, you know, they've really added to their squad, and that includes, you know, we can even talk about Costa's arrival last year. They're gonna challenge for the league, mm -hmm. and they're gonna challenge for the Champions League. The real question is, is who's the best team in, in Madrid right now? Right, well, um, with all those stars we named on Real Madrid, if they can, put it together they should be completely fine 
new coach. We don't we don't know how well, this that's is the all going to shake mark. up. I say shake keep out. put it all together. Yeah. Will they be able to? Well, that's the that's what we're going to be looking for in uh, La Liga this year, which begins on Friday. It does tomorrow. A very exciting weekend. I get, last weekend was exciting too to see the Premier League start back up, but this weekend we got Liga, La Liga, Serie A, and Bundesliga starting up. Barcelona, Real Madrid, and Atletico Madrid will finish one, two, and three. I don't know in what order. Mm-hmm. I can make something up on the spot if you want, but uh, I let's still say think Barcelona one, Atletico Madrid two, Real Madrid three. I, I still think Barcelona is the top team, and I think is getting or maybe didn't get enough uh, enough credit for. I feel like their crash out in the Champions League was just way too much of a hit on how good of a team they were in all of Europe. And it was a massive upset that they, and, and collapse, that they ha- gave, surrendered a three-goal lead to Roma in the Champions League quarterfinals. Well, if they advance through that and end up with a draw against Liverpool, they kind of seems like they might have really missed a, a good opportunity to be back in the Champions League final. Yeah. And I think that there's no reason they shouldn't be right back there this year, at least in the semifinals. And, and through that, I think that they're the best team in La Liga. They still have Lionel Messi, still at pretty much the top of his game, at least for one more year. And I like them to win the league. And I, but I am excited that Atletico seems to be... I think La Liga is better when you have Atletico maybe challenging for the top of the league and creating fits at Real Madrid and mm-hmm. s- sending Real Madrid up in flames and they're going to switch their goalie and they're going to switch this and they're going to switch that and it just makes for exciting yeah. transfers and everything, a lot of ripple effects. Can anybody else challenge this trio? Maybe Valencia, they, they've they added a couple interesting players. Denis Cherishev, Russia's World Cup hero. Mishi Batshuayi, who gave uh, the best World Cup blooper. Uh, scored a couple goals. Uh, scored a few goals for Dortmund last year, um, so they they could be interesting. I'm, I'm not sure what Sevilla and Villarreal will uh, what they'll bring this year. Well, there's always one team in La Liga that comes out of nowhere. It might be Real Sociedad or something like that. That you know really comes out and pushes the top teams. But uh, yeah, I think you kind of know what the top four or five will be. But you know to find out what order, I guess that's what we have to wait and see. Moving on to Serie A, and we're trying to rapid fire through this this list of topics we've got. Back again to the Cristiano Ronaldo saga that continues on. He will start with Juventus. They'll play the first match of the Serie A season on Saturday. What kind of impact will Ronaldo have on Serie A? I think we've already seen it. There's obviously immense popularity. I think the first official, this is an actual by the books effect that we're seeing is ESPN getting in on the rights for the Serie A in the United States, broadcasting rights. It's kind of a huge deal. Serie A has been on BN Sports in the United States for a number of years, which most people just don't have, aren't really aware of how to access it. And once you do even access it digitally, it's kind of not a very well-run operation. ESPN obviously is well-polished, and they've done soccer in the past. And it'll even... BN's been okay for... uh yeah, I've been okay. <laughs> I haven't had a problem watching games on BN for as long as games have been on it. Well, it's because you're a seasoned pro at watching international soccer games. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you know where to go and where to find things, it's not that hard. Yeah. Well, I guess what the casual soccer fan, the guy that wants to wake up on Saturday and watch... That's not a casual fan. That's... Well... Yeah, you're right. <laughs> but I guess I'll put it this way. We were talking about La Liga, and you, you were asking me earlier, were you going to watch Valencia versus whoever? I would watch Real Madrid versus Valencia last season on BN Sports simply because Ronaldo was playing. I can tell you now, despite all the good players that Real Madrid still has, if it's Real Madrid versus Valencia, I'm probably not going to watch it. Because Ronaldo's not there. I will probably then shift over and try and find... Ronaldo. Ronaldo. <laughs> Jesus, or Mark. <laughs> or maybe... I think it's just that big of a drop-off. What are you going to do in four years when Ronaldo... Or ten years when Ronaldo's retired and you have to watch someone else? Maybe Christian Pulisic will be that good by... <laughs> <Goodness>. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. 
I'll figure something else out. It's yeah, like you're gonna have to. It's like you know being a Game of Thrones fans or something. You know, eventually it's gonna end. I know it's gonna end. Somebody's gonna die. <laughs> Your favorite character is gonna <laughs> die. You're gonna stop watching the show. I'm not gonna stop watching. I'm just gonna you know I'll, I'll know how to move on when that time comes, and the time hasn't come yet. But in addition to just simply being able to view that game, ESPN is much more present. Just I think in everybody's digital world. Like, you'll see something ESPN-related pop up on your Twitter feed, even though you don't follow anything ESPN-related on your Twitter. Sure. And I think it just becomes much more likely that things like a Serie A Top 10 Goals of the Week video suddenly pops into your Twitter timeline because Ronaldo's in the league and ESPN's pushing it out and they're trying to push up the popularity of the league. Yeah. Just things like that. And just become, it just raises the awareness of the different things going on in Italian soccer. Yeah, I suppose, but I don't expect stateside sports fans to become any more educated on Serie A or Italian soccer than they already ha- are through ESPN. I think they'll just see a highlight pop up and Ronaldo scores. That's number eight on our list. <laughs> Moving on to tennis right? You know, exactly, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I have a feeling it'll get lost in ESPN's vast ecosystem. They might do a lot to promote it but at least early on yeah i i'd be surprised if uh all of a sudden italian soccer becomes uh, let's say overtakes the premier league or overtakes la liga in the united states um, in terms of popularity well let me ask you this what will do more just from where they are popularity wise right now to these new things that have gone come into place what will do more for the league in the United States? Serie A's rights with ESPN mm-hmm. or La Liga playing games in the United States? Which one is more is going to create more popularity in the United States for the league? Ah, oh, I got Mark, a good one on you. We've been podcasting for, uh, what, 14 months, 15 months? Something like that. That is the single best question you've ever asked <laughs> me. <laughs> Finally did one. <laughs> I mean, that is that is a fantastic question. Uh, All right. Wow. The stuff I'm thinking about, it too. I have the, no idea. Yeah, ESPN broadcast and stream versus playing a live game. I'm going to go with the broadcast because the live game will just be an event in one city. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't really see it having a national... Resonance. Um, they'll probably do it in Miami or in Los Angeles, uh, maybe Houston or Phoenix. Maybe um, New York. I'd be surprised if it. I mean, I, I I have a feeling it'll be you know major market, probably mm-hmm. in the East Coast or in the Southwest, um, and I would include Texas in the Southwest. Okay. Um, yeah, I would go with ESPN. Okay. But ESPN doesn't have the clout that it did Sure. Uh, years ago. You know, I don't think either, I mean, to answer your, the, the best answer I can give you for your question is that neither of them are, are going to make interest spike um, in either of these leagues. I think ESPN is just, that's where you watch Italian soccer now. Um, even if they play one game a week, I don't see that doing too much for the league. I agree um, with you. You know, ESPN used to have one Premier League game a week. Didn't do too much for exposure, I don't think. Um, I mean, it exposed me to the Premier League, but... Well, I um, think it probably did more then because when that was the case, you just the, the sheer amount of things that you had the options of watching was limited or more limited back then yeah now i can literally watch you know any division three college football game i want Mm -hmm. let alone everything else that's going on yeah um but yeah no i agree that the i guess the effects will be minimal i do think that the la liga matches will basically kind of do more for soccer popularity in america in general then it will so. for I think, the I think those will be local events. Yeah. Um, you know, wherever the city, it'll be maybe a big deal for a couple of days. They might, you know, bring 40, 50, 60,000 people out 
but I don't think those cities are all, all of a sudden going to become La Liga hotbeds right. or no, anything like that. that. Um, same with Syria. I don't really see, you know, Syria is now easier to watch in the United States. Yeah. Um, I don't know how many of the games they'll be putting on. You know, one game broadcast per week. Most of the rest on uh, most of the rest being streamed. Okay. Yeah, times are changing. I don't really know uh, how this is going to work, but ask me again in a few weeks. Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can't. Great question, though. No, yeah. I mean, it was. I think it stumped both of us that way. You know. Yeah. So back to Syria. We talked about Ronaldo, but another big story is that Parma. Yeah. After going bankrupt and being relegated to Serie D, mm -hmm. uh, is back up. Yeah. First Italian club to achieve three straight promotions, uh, which is pretty impressive. It is, yeah. But it's kind of like an exaggerated version of when Juventus was down in Serie B and they finally... and they Well, they went down to Serie B. Parma went yeah. all the way back all up. All the way down. Um, it's good. Parma is, you know, historically one of Italy's biggest teams and... Uh, having them in there is just better for the league. They are a bigger club, bigger fan base, uh, able to sign better players than maybe a um, Kievo Verona or Hellas Verona <laughs> might be able to go and sign. God bless No him. offense to those <laughs> clubs. Um, and they've, you know, done some interesting transfers. Bruno Alves, Jonathan Bieni. Federico DeMarco, Alessoni, Bestoni, and they've been linked with Antonio Cassano, who uh, I think he's been retired for. T he's, he's sort of the uh, the bad boy of Italian soccer for the last <laughs> ten years. Uh, he's been retired for two years or been away from the game, but yeah, I'd like to see him come back and I'd like to see him uh, do well. I this is exciting just because I think at the very least it sort of ignites. You know, just kind of classic Italian soccer yeah, rivalries. ancient rivalries coming and back. It's even when this, you know, if you just compare it to Red Sox-Yankees, even though if the Yankees suck or if the Red Sox suck or if they both suck, it still is kind of another reason to get excited, another reason to pick your head up. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, Parma's kind of right in the middle of northern Italy, Surrounded by Milan and Turin and just right there, yeah. and right in the mixer. So it's just, yeah, another big, big name back up in Syria. It's good for them to be back. And, you know, as Italian soccer tries to lick its wounds from missing the World Cup mm -hmm. and uh, not, I guess, having not had the most Champions League success. I don't know the last time they won. Was it 2010? Uh, pff, boy, <laughs> maybe 2007, AC Milan. Right. Oh, no, Inter, 2010. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah, there it is, yeah. They beat Bayern Munich. So, yeah, it just, and just kind of trying to get back. And this is what Syria, sort of what Syria really needs is the Milan clubs to return to their yeah. prominence. Um that's been the big problem for the last five years or so, is that... They've been disarray. You know, yeah. Um, both of them have had ownership changes that, uh, you know, just destabilize the whole club. Lack of planning. So, uh, yeah, Milan is now... AC Milan is now in control of... Uh, or now is controlled by an American hedge fund, uh, which brought Paolo Maldini back. And, you know, they're kind of reconnecting to their uh, history. Leonardo is back as their sporting director. So, yeah, some interesting things are happening. Still think it'll be another couple years before they're ready to challenge uh, Juventus. I see Juventus running away with it again. Uh, yeah. Juventus is really playing in a different league, as they have been for the last five years or so. Um, yeah, I think uh, at, at least in this coming year, the second best team will be Roma once again. But that's just, or not once again, I'm sorry, Napoli was finished second last year. But I feel like it'll be another battle for second place, which is yeah. 
it, it it can be interested, it interesting is interesting if you are if a you fan if of you Syria. Com- yeah if you commit <laughs> yeah. to it but it's understandable yeah. that it doesn't exactly capture the eyes of the world oh. and um, especially given that Juventus has won I believe five years in a row now it could be Seven. six what <laughs> you just lose track at a certain point yeah so yeah and I think that'll happen again obviously Ronaldo being on the team doesn't help parity in the league but I think it helps the league overall uh, and really you know they're gunning for the Champions League title that's which what they're playing for yeah I, at, at a certain point you just have to start rooting for them as a Serie A person and I, I guess <laughs> do you think <laughs> Buffon will be cheering for Juventus uh, not if they face PSG uh huh um, How much I mean, will Buffon play? Is, we haven't talked about that. We don't have to. He's, he's on. starting. He's PSG st- number one. Is he just going to be the number one? He already is. How old is he? He's Gigi Buffon. <laughs> 40 something. 50. I don't know. Yeah, like 44? No, he's. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> 41, 42. He's old. But he's so, Buffon. He's a legend. No, he's 40. 40. 41 in January. Okay. So from a league on the rise, hopefully, to a league that I believe might be on a slight downturn is the Bundesliga, or at least how they'll compete in European play. The Bundesliga starts up again. Bayern Munich, once again, the favorites, obviously. And... I don't know. What, what's most exciting about the Bundesliga? We'll talk about the American players, but anything beyond that? Um, yeah, I like to see what uh, happens underneath Bayern. Uh, Red Bull Leipzig, Borussia Dortmund. Were, uh, they are or were interesting projects at least a year or two ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they've been, you know, the problem with these German clubs is that they get picked apart almost on an annual basis so you know they can never get a core of good young players to grow up together and start winning and challenging things because Bayern Munich swoops in or uh, their foreign players can always make more money in other countries Um, so the Bundesliga kind of just is what it is Um, you know it's a good league yeah there's one great club a number of good clubs and those other good clubs are basically playing for second mm. I think the uh, biggest reason of interest at least for me is the large number of American players in the Bundesliga uh, beyond just Christian Pulisic as we've listed them here we've got John Brooks with Wolfsburg Alfredo Morales with Fortuna Dusseldorf Timmy Chandler with Eintracht Frankfurt, Eintracht Frankfurt, Don't Bobby Wood, <laughs> Hanover '96, Aaron Johansson, Johansson, and Josh Sargent, Chris Richards, on loan at Bayern Munich from FC Dallas. So that's a lot of American players, yeah. and at first it's exciting, but for me it's it's almost like a question mark, like how. Why are so many American players going to Germany? Is it because it, they can? Um, I that? think Germany is a good place to learn how to be a pro. Uh-huh. And what you do with that knowledge is up to you. You know, soccer is a very self-driven game. Um, but it's, you know, they kind of teach you what it takes to really make it. Um, you know, it's like the finishing school for soccer players. Yeah. And yes, unless you're playing for Bayern Munich, you're really not expecting to win major competitions. Uh, but yeah, great place to learn. You look at Pulisic from age 16 to, is he even 20 yet? I think he, maybe no. he's 19. I think he's 19, um, yeah. But yeah, his development is just accelerated. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the thing about Germany is that when you're a guy like Pulisic, he can play in Germany till he's 21, 22, and then go anywhere as a seasoned pro. Right. Um, so, 
Yeah, you're, you're getting great coaching, great facilities, uh, big stadiums, packed stadiums. It's a good league. It's just not, uh, I think, because of sort of market forces within German soccer, and uh, I think specifically the lack of foreign investment. Um, you know, members have, have to, club members have to own at least 51% of each club. Um, so that keeps kind of the big money out of the game, right. um, out of the German game. But either way, Germans know how to produce good teams and good players. They're just kind of falling behind other uh, other super clubs. Um, and the super clubs are backed by super money. Right. Well, so... Just as a good example of a good young player playing someplace else, Timothy Weah is at PSG. Mm -hmm. And I guess there's a long list of reasons for why he's there. But What are they? <laughs> or what's the first two? Well, his dad played there. So? Well, maybe that helped him. <laughs> Well, not help him, but just like maybe that's why he decided to play. No, at PSG. reason number one, he's damn good. Yeah. <laughs> reason number two, he's damn good. <laughs> um, yeah, Timothy Way is getting minutes right. at age eighteen as a striker. Um, now, sure, maybe they gave him a chance because his dad is a Ballon d'Or winner, but he's worked his way through that academy and through that system. Uh -huh. And now he's broken through, so. Um, but is it maybe just like a counterexample of like, well, maybe you don't have to just go to Germany. You can go someplace else if you, you have can go. Idea. You can go anywhere, but, you know, most American players aren't going to PSG. Right. Um, and if and when they do, they're not getting games. Right. Well, yeah, I guess speaking of, that was our next topic is, Timothy Weah in the French League and... Not scoring goals in League One. Right. But yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, American players can go anywhere and play anywhere. It's just getting in the right fit, the right club. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, Timothy Weah scored an 89th minute of PSG's opener. Yep. So that's exciting. We'll see how much more playing time he gets. Neymar, I guess, ahead of him there. He came on for Neymar. Yeah. But do we want to move right on to Kevin De Bruyne? Yeah, maybe this should be our last. Uh, well, you don't want to talk MLS. about Wayne Rooney? No, not really. <laughs> He's playing well in MLS. Good for him. Yeah. Uh, Kevin De Bruyne is out. Um, torn ligament, the suspected tear. Man City hasn't, uh, you know, announced what the diagnosis is. But all the rumors yesterday was that it was a torn ligament, not the ACL. In uh, his knee, which is a similar injury to the one that he had in 2015-16 that kept him out for 10 weeks. Mm. I've seen him potentially out for six weeks, uh, rumored this time around for six weeks, and then I've seen four months. So That's it's, a long uh, Yeah, it's a, big it's, a, it's a big spread. I have six to 16 weeks, um, and I think we should just wait until Man City announces something. But Man City has games October 7th against Liverpool, October 28th against Tottenham. Uh, my major takeaway on this injury is that this makes a title race. Right. Take Man City's best player out, and believe you me, De Bruyne was their best player last season and probably the season before. Take him out of the team, and that's maybe five points, uh, maybe more. You know, this right. is... We're going to have a real title race on, on this one. And you hate, you know, you hate to see because of an injury to a major player, but these things happen. Yeah. And the injury happened in training also, which just kind of really is unfortunate. Bad luck. But, yeah, so a lot of big matches to take place for Man City in that time. Obviously, it could be essentially half the season, yeah. if not more. It's pretty much guaranteed that he's not going to play against Liverpool 
the game against Tottenham, which nobody knows where it will take place <laughs> um, because Tottenham hasn't finished building their stadium. Well, maybe they'll want to wait for an easy opponent to ensure a victory in their new opening stadium. Yeah, match. but those are those are key games for Man City in the next couple months, and De Bruyne won't be there. Um, he's also going to miss a decent chunk of the Champions League group stage, which right. I think a team like Man City can navigate. Um, at least, yeah, at least the group stage. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, without their best player, once again, everything just gets a little bit tougher. Right. Speaking of the Champions League, the draw date. When is that? That is August 30th. Oh, good. So be sure to tune back in to the Ness and Soccer podcast on August 30th, maybe 31st, as we recap the group stage being set. But, yeah, I mean, obviously a huge injury as the season gets going. Unfortunate for Man City, but maybe fortunate for the Premier League as far as keeping the table tight and close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's going to uh, – Man City uh, – sorry, Man United and Liverpool certainly are uh, – their eyes are going to get a little bit bigger after this injury because whatever – title hopes and chances they had uh, before yesterday, Wednesday's injury, they've just improved. All right. Well, under, you know, anonymous topics, I'll just say them out loud. Wayne Rooney had a fantastic play in a a long, a steal and long pass for an assist in D.C. United versus Orlando City. Mm -hmm. Austin, Texas. Wayne Rooney then scored two goals last night in their victory over, I forget who. (laughs) So, yeah, playing well. In Austin, Texas, the city voted on stadium for the Columbus crew. Mm -hmm. That happened on Wednesday. And then the original Ronaldo was hospitalized in Spain with the flu, but he's apparently fine. So there's your soccer around the world news. All right. Yeah, thanks for joining (laughs) us. Be sure to check us out on iTunes by searching Nessun and where you can follow every Nesson Soccer podcast as well as every Nesson podcast. That's for those of you that might be listening on YouTube. Stop listening on YouTube. Start listening on iTunes <laughs> so that we can make some money. Marcus, thanks for joining me. And uh, it's my pleasure. See, see everyone else later. Why I tell you so. Come on.